peace kings and peace queens welcome into my review of the isis thesis uh, really what i want to get into is basically chapter 15 in the book where they're talking about the serpents of the amduats 12 hours um key information here because it seems as though that the pharaohs were using a science that describes the quantum experience and molecules that the deceased encounters in the afterlife. Uh, we gain the trust, or I've gained the trust of them actually being accurate on what they were talking about because of their the preciseness of how they understood the transcribing of DNA to RNA to protein. So, you know, being that they were able to uh, dissect DNA on such a miniature level back in the day like that, you know, it. like I said, I'm more inclined to believe uh, the information that they're producing in this book that allows us to take advantage of um, our chemiluminescent body after we pass on from the land of matter. But that's neither here nor there right now. What we're going to understand today is what the proteins really mean in the Amduat, according to what the Isis thesis is presenting here. But first, we got to get a good understanding of gene expression. And, you know, a lot of us aren't scientists. I'm not a scientist myself, but, you know, I did dig into it. And I, I, through reading these books, I've gotten a better understanding of gene expression. Um, and so first, we're going to cover that just some basic gene expression and, uh, you know, some basic movements within the gene expression network um, so that we can have an understanding of the serpents. And we're going to run into it right now. Now, the first thing to understand in gene expression is, this is how it goes. We go from DNA to mRNA to protein. All right, everybody's heard of protein. Um, but first we're gonna start on the DNA side of things. DNA is a nucleic acid made up of millions of atoms. Now, the, the nucleic acid is where the genetic info is found for the particular cell. Boom, here's a picture of the gene right here, okay? My wife drew this beautiful picture. Uh, we were drawing DNA all day, so boom. Anyway, now the mRNA is the DNA, the, the information that's being carried, uh, carried out from the gene to build a protein to build one of these chains on the chromosome here, on the gene here. Okay, so the gene has the information, but it has to be carried out through the mRNA, which can tr can read the information that's coming from here because protein just can't do it on its own. It must be read, and the person that does this is the thought of the whole situation, the 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 mind of the information, the the word. So we have the word being spoken here with the thought here, the mRNA or mercury. Um, and then that goes into protein and a lot of the protein, uh, I don't know if you've seen these chains right here is where a lot of the protein is being coded for. And actually these chains are a whole bunch of these A's and G's and T's and C's that's being, uh, depending on what the gene has, uh, being transcribed due to mRNA, uh, is being told to build certain proteins in certain parts um, of whatever it's building, whatever organism is building. So everything is carried out through protein physically, you know what I mean? And this is the process. Um, now those A's, G's, T's, and C's, we're gonna break them down. I know you see some Hebrew letters up under there um, and it's not going from right to left like Hebrew should be, but you see the yo hey vah hey. But let me at first 
talk about what the A's, the G's, and the T's, and the C's. At least tell you the name of those things right there. So we have adenosine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. The basic structure in organism building. This is the Jehovah or yod heh So everything that's going to be transcribed from the gene here and put along these chains are going to be physically broken down like this or smaller versions of these. So when you hear think words like polymers, um, activators and um, enzymes, just think there's gotta be a protein that needs to be made for that function to go off. All right. So the way the proteins build things up is through binding, which you can see here because, you know, the, the pattern that the DNA or the chromosome is making here is, is a constant twisting, turning type of pattern with these chains of proteins in between. Now, once again, back to this thing here. Each one of the primary sides of these things are called a helix. So you see two helix here as the classic form of DNA for um, us would be this beta sheet with this to a double helix here. Now, in most cases in the MDUI, the helix, which is binding, like snakes bind, are related to uh, being the correspondence for that in the MDUI are snakes. Well, snake here is to be specific. Yeah, so we have the helix here. What a helix is an extended spiral chain of atoms in a protein. Because in the proteins, we do atoms make up everything, or atom. Atom, 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 atom. Make up everything. We have the atomic, we have the atomic list, the atomic uh, chart. So we got atoms and everything, so we understand that. Okay, so that's what a helix is. And, you know, nuclear acid of atoms in a protein, nuclear acid of other polymeric molecules. Polymeric, when you, like I said, when you hear words like that, they're just smaller versions of the, the adenine, the guanine, the thymine, and the cytosine. That's it. Smaller versions of Jehovah. Also about these helixes, they turn certain ways, like they might have a right hand turn or a left hand turn that de determines completely what type of helix is going to be named or anything like that too. But the big thing to understand here is that they're binding and they're twisting and their relationship to snakes and the ingenious pharaohs that were able to figure that out and illustrate it. <laughs> now. When these things are binding, each one, and we were talking about the turns, depending on what is turning or what protein it is, it's going to I mean, it's gonna have different chains of proteins or polymers all over it, too. So um, that's going to determine what type of motif or what type of gene it particularly is. It's going to be the number of proteins and um, what function um, is carrying out too. But it's good just to understand that the snakes are binding. There's going to be a binding type situation. And I'm just bringing this out because there are going to be times in the illustrations where we're going to see that they're going to call for a specific turn. And you just need to see, I mean, for them to be able to find that, it's just going to be amazing. But, uh, uh, and like I said earlier, seven serpents or proteins glide through the book Am Do What, which describes the chemical reactions related to transcription, 
the lytic lifestyle and prophet's excision. Textual descriptions and actual drawings show a remarkable correspondence between Egyptian serpents and DNA binding proteins. When describing the DNA binding protein, the pharaohs portrayed the molecules as serpents with three, four, or five heads that correspond to the protein's alpha helix primary structures and beta sheets. The following brief summary of the proteins that appear at the appropriate time during the described chemical reactions will aid us in our journey through the Amduat. Now, first one we get to is the Lex A monster repressor protein Apophis. Now, the pyramid text referred to Apophis as a full coiled monster snake. The structure of Lex A repressor, as determined by a spectral copy, contains three alpha helices and one anti parallel beta sheet. The beta sheet exhibits a cord like shape that could be described as a coil. Now, this picture does not express um, all of the heads and stuff on the snakes and the coils on this particular one that we were talking about that, that matches up. Because right now we have this particular uh, Lex A repressor um, being subdued. So these are actually feathers that we have inside the snake on, on the snake here. These are the genes that they're repressing or holding back. Um, yeah, so as an example of that right there, we have uh, Lady Isis at the front. So, you know, we do see a course, you know, something. Well, we're not getting to that yet. So. Right now, we have it fettered. Right. It's repressing the genes of the lac operon. And... All right. The lac operon. It's the best... This is the best model for the regulation of gene expression. Um, it's the basic model. So... We got to understand how the lac operon works so we can understand the flow of the serpent use in this uh, particular example. The expression of genes can be transcriptionally regulated. Such regulation is a critical feature of both eukaryotic and prokaryotic organisms. One of the classical systems used to investigate transcriptural regulation was originally investigated by Jacobi, Manal, and Pardee. Their studies involved the transcriptural regulation of the genes used to ferment lactose in the bacterium E. coli. Three genes clustered together on the chromosome are required for the bacterium to utilize lactose. Lac Z gene that codes for the enzyme beta galactosidase. The lac Y gene that codes for a lactose permase. And the lac A gene that codes for the enzyme the lactoside transactylase. Now, the LAC-P region is the promoter that is needed to transcribe the LAC-Z, the LAC-Y, and the LAC-A as a single polycystronic messenger RNA. All right, so that's a mouthful of it. And keep in mind when we hear words like polycystronic <laughs> or polymers and stuff like that, remember the rule in the beginning. And we're still talking about the basic protein, the base pairs of proteins that uh, the smaller versions of the uh, 
the full proteins we, we went over earlier. Now, the lac O is an operator site that is involved in the transcriptural regulation of the lac operon. The unit consisting of the lac promoter, lac operator, and lac Z, lac Y, and lac A gene is called the lac operon. So, not all of this, just this here. Located near but not in tandem with the lac region is the lac I regulatory gene that codes for a mRNA that is translated to produce a protein referred to as the lac repressor. Ah, so this is going to be our apophis within this lac operon, and this is the example here. The regulatory gene, and it makes this little protein here, the full coiled monster that we were talking about earlier, but looks more like <laughs> not a, a full coiled monster, but that's my drawing. Anyway, back to it. In the absence of lactose inside the cell, the lac repressive protein or apophis is active. In its active state, the lac repressor recognizes and binds to the lac operator site. So we see these dotted lines coming up here. And this is the lac, like we discussed earlier, the lac operator site. So this comes here and be creates a barrier that doesn't, I mean, that keeps these guys locked in here and not able to uh, participate with the rest of the system. Yes, in its active state, if the lac repressor recognizes and binds to the lac operator site, when the lac repressor is bound to the lac operator site, RNA polymerase is prohibited from recognizing lac promoter and lac Z, lac Y, and lac A genes are not transcribed. All right. When lactose enters the cell, lactose enters the cell, a small amount of it is converted to allolactose via beta galactosidase. Allolactose binds to the lac repressor because the, the lac rep repressor loves milk itself. <laughs> so it binds to the lac repressor. This causes a conformational change in the lac repressor protein that prevents it from binding to the lac operator site. So once we have another form of energy that can fuel the protein coming to the cell that is attracted to, like when it's out of the regular glucose, it's going to be looking for the, the, galacto, the, the galactosidase. You know what I mean? And just because of the, the basal transcription in the cell, we're going to have that. We'll explain that later, but we're going to have it available in the cell at times too, which is going to cause this to dislodge itself from the operator site and allow us ac allow access, the cell access to the, uh, the lac operon. Right. And like we just said, with, with Alan, uh, an active lac repressor bound to the lac operator site, RNA polymerase, is able to bind to the promoter, and a polycystronic mRNA is transcribed that includes the lac Z, lac Y, and lac A genes. Now, this polycystronic messenger RNA is then translated to produce the beta galactosidase, lac lactose permease, and galactosidase trans accolades you know i just butchered that again proteins therefore the induction of the lac operon enables the bacterium to efficiently transport lactose into the cell and metabolize it okay all right now some of the things that causes the cell to go into this mode is going to be the double lion that I believe Panic was talking about in this video at some point. 
um, or the thymine diamond, which is the same thing. The thymine diamond, which is the uh, the double lion that Panic was talking about, is really UV damage that attacks the cell. And that causes uh, that causes the cell to well, they, the 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 sugar is gone from the cell at that point, and then the cell is looking for any form of energy to, uh, you know, make it move. So of course it's going to start looking for milk because milk basically is in the structure of all of the uh, proteins, the basic proteins that we are using to make up our body is in the basic structure. So, you know, it's not going to look for it first if it's going to be sugar that's available in the body for the uh, um, to run and propel itself off of. But when it's out of sugar and it can't get it easily, your cell will go and look for milk. And uh, just keep in mind when we get into later videos that ISIS is going to be, or uh, a set is going to be the symbol of the lactose inside the cell itself too. So keep that in mind. We're going to move on. Well, maybe y'all can listen while I'm racing. And some might wonder... What causes the UV damage was ultraviolet. So, of course, it's going to be light. But as far as this, you know, we're going, we're going to follow the correspondences as far as uh, life goes here. And some of the light that's going to be damaging the cells or stopping the production so that you can release some of these, uh, this information backed up in the uh, bacteria. Is going to be the information that you bring into yourself, um, the information that you study and you take into your own heart. It's going to be your own light that's going to uh, affect your genes because uh, essentially you write it into your system and your makeup. Anybody that has a religious system, you know, they really believe what they believe and it's written into them, you know, from young children's status or people that have come to a different knowledge than what they had grown up with, still the same, the same processes in play right there too. They're encoding it into their genes. So that's why you see knowledge or gnosis, uh, you know, synonymous with uh, light, you know, in a lot of demonstrations. And that's how you can make it work on a genetic scale too. Alright, so since we have a, uh, comp a good comprehensive understanding of the lactose aberron, we can move on to the proteins and find the relations between that and the snakes a little bit more. Alright, and now for the serpents. Uh, the Lex A monster repressor protein Apophis. Now the pyramid text referred to Apophis as a foyer, a four-coiled monster snake. The structure of the Lex A repressor, as determined by the spectral copy, contains three regular alpha helices and one anti-parallel beta sheet. The beta sheet exhibits a coil-like shape that could be described as a coil. Thus, we have a four coil monster that represses 42 genes while allowing the act of lambda CI repressor to maintain the profits in an inert state and permitting the act of lac repressor protein to bind to the DNA operator sequence to prevent lactose activity. In hour seven of the Amduat, we find textual references to Apophis and a drawing of a long fettered serpent. Yes, and I agree with what they were saying. They, this is not a picture of the four coiled monster that you probably were hearing described as Apophis uh, throughout the Amduat. Um, actually just have this long serpent just stretched out here. And 
in my opinion, I think they were trying to represent the uh, different gene seats and uh, like the lack A and the lack Y. I mean, well, like the lack Y repressive, repressive. I mean, the lack Y genes and that illustration that we had up here earlier, that right before this. Um, and I think that because I could just see the what looks like the gene seats right there where you have the feathers at. Um, yeah, so I still think this is a decent depiction of the Lexate monster repressive protein for that reasons that I just expressed. And we're also trying to fetter this monster here because this is the monster that is repressing the genes that we want to really get to and utilize so we can access our chemiluminescent body. So, and th that little illustration of that little thing that I had blocking the operator seat, that is a poppet. So I wish I could have drew a better picture, um, something that resembled this a little bit more, but hey, that's neither here nor there right now. All right, and a papis or a pet is none of, none other than a deity who would, who embodied the chaos in the in Egypt, and was thus the opponent of light and order, which is my eye. And of course, the symbol is a snake. <clears throat> it's rather interesting that uh, a papis pretty much is the reason while we have human life as far as uh, the Isis thesis is concerned. Because in actuality, he represses those genes that allow us to access the body that deals with, um, that doesn't deal with being powered by uh, photosynthesis. Up next is the Rec A protein Mahin. Rec A protein is a multifunctional enzyme with two roles. In its first role, the protein mediates strand exchange during recombination. The second role involves the cleavage of the Lex A repressor protein or a pipus during an SOS response. An SOS response, a uh, good example of that is UV damage. And that's why you really get the SOS response and then kick into that little example that you saw earlier or pre prior to uh, the snake demonstration. Rec A has two smaller domains stabilizing a six helical polymer of protein subunits and interhelical bundles. Now, representations in the Cairo coffin map from the book of the two ways depicts a similar structure. The top uray represent the two smaller domains stabilizing the six helical, helical polymer of protein subunits. Signified by the bottom six uray of interhelical bundles. However, in the MDY, the protein is depicted as a serpent around the sun god. Which seems appropriate for in its first role related to recombination, Rec A forms a helical filament around SDNA. In a cold protease activity, the SSDNA slash Rec A filament cleaves the Lex A repressor protein, which catalyzes its own digestion. So this th this beauty here and the other picture that we had up cuts out a pappus and it starts putting a new well, and it fills in the gap. So it does two functions. Really, science hasn't been able to completely figure out how this thing 
does both and in what manner it does. So, still a little known mystery. But, the, man, totally blown away by how the Egyptians are able to see something that small that's within the cell and have depictions of it that correlate with their uh, religious stories. <laughs> Or correlate with their religious characters. Or, you know, yeah. I mean, man, that is beautiful. <laughs> we will carry on. Up next is Crow Repressor Protein Horse. All right. Our four of the MDY shows a three-headed serpent that matches up with the active three helixes Crow, press, crow Repressor uh, Aphage Lambda. That represses CI with its three helices. These three helices repress the uh, the CI. And it's good that they're, this is showing you that th this picture is great. I love this picture because, of course, each one of the heads are representing the, al the alpha helices. The, uh, the primary protein structure and living organisms, especially us. The DNA binding protein is a homodimer with each subunit being 66 amino acids in length. Having a helix turn helix motif, the repressor has three alpha helices, two of which are separated by a short turn with a third helix fitting into the major groove. Operator DNA. Now, this picture this depicts a sketch of the active crow protein with three serpents, serpent heads, 14 discs, 14 heads, and 14 stars from the Amduai Hour 4 in the tomb of Ramesses the Sixth. Lambda CI Repressor Protein Seth. Now, in this picture, the Lambda CI Repressor regulates phage gene expression in the lysogenic state by binding to OR and OL operator sequences. The dimeric repressor has five alpha helices in a bundle with two helices and three forming a helix turn helix. And here's that helix turn helix here. Let me flip this upside down here so you can see it better. I got the words written upside down with now too, but we got it. All right. And you can see the different turns here for the alpha helices. I mean, that is so neat, man. Definitely this is Seth. This is, uh, you see the beetle there. So, of course, that's representing... Uh, the sun god right there too and who's in control of life right now which is set which is supposed to be the human race here but yes it has the alpha helices that are on this particular protein five just like it said and it's even detailing the turns here and this is what you see here at these the second and third spot oh man just beautiful i don't know what they use to see that far you know what I mean? I don't know where they got this technology from, but it, this is just marvelous, man. I'm starting to think that modern science stole everything from the Egyptians. All right. Next up is the cat. Catabolite gene activator protein. Now, the winged three-headed serpent in our five represents cat protein, also known as camp receptor protein or CRP classified by modern biologists as the wing helix turn helix. We're talking about that guy right there. And look at these wings. Yep. So it's helix turn helix, uh, DNA binding protein. 
Now the protein exhibits an extensive beta sheet structure, which are the wings here. And three alpha helices. So you can see the alpha helices right here, the three heads there, and the wing on top of that serpent there. In the absence of glucose, cat binds to the CRP site near the lac operon promoter, stimulates transcription of the lac operon, and interacts with the RNA polymerase. Wow, okay. But big thing here, I was just trying to point out the, the wings that we have. Those are the same type of wings that... Uh, created a beta that creates a beta sheet when you're looking at it for real then it looks like another head or another alpha helis or something like that but it's just amazing again that something so miniature was able to be breaking down and uh, and attributed to it characteristics of um a religion that they a religion or a way of life that they follow and you know um, and corresponded with the characters that they use in this religion or the story and way of life. I'm trying to, for lack of a better phrase. Moving right along. The lac operon is under, is also under positive control by cap or catabolite act activated protein. Now thought to be bound to its lac binding site at all times, even during repression. Now, the image here shows the presence of cat at the lac binding site next to which the prophet Osiris is lodged to the host chromosome E. coli grown on glucose do not metabolize lactose until glucose is absent. Again, E. coli grown on glucose does not metabolize lactose until glucose is absent. So the cell is Energy is energized by glucose, but it will use the milk, which is the lactose, after the glucose is gone. This is called catabolite expression. Glucose represses the lac operon E. coli by preventing the entry of lactose, lactose through an occasionally present lac permease molecule. Oh, did the brother let this go out? We're going to keep looking at that. I'm sorry, guys. Oh. Now, also, this sketch uh, depicts the uh, pyramidal mound of the lac Z gene seat where the prophet is lodged in the dark chamber. In line with modern research, the text showed the wing HTH serpent or cap protein bound to its lac binding site to simulate transcription. All right. And like I said, the example that we had prior to us starting the serpents portion of this video um, definitely is being depicted here in this seat, when, especially when they're talking about the lac Z gene seat. Right. So once again, something so small being able to be characterized in such a colorful way by these people. Over 5,000 years ago, it's just, you know, like I said, it's mind-blowing. It's incredible, man. All right. Number six, the lac repressor protein. The lac repressor protein keeps the lactose genes turned off in the cell and is also active because of the lex A monster repressor protein apophis. But... With the Lex A or Apophis mastered, the lac repressor bonds to allolactose rather than the DNA operator sequences, so that the necessary genes for the hard species are transcribed. The prophet is lodged between the Lac Z gal and biogene sites. The Lac Z or B gal 116K DNA monomer is active as a tetramer. Now, you can see that they can point that out right there because of the feet, the four feet on there, so. The 
The Awatan representation of the two-headed serpent with four legs depicts the structure of lac repressor protein having four polypeptide subunits which form a tetrama of four legs. The protein has bonding sites for both allolactose and the operator sequence of DNA, as indicated by its two heads. When repressing the lac genes, the headpiece of the first 56 amino acids of the lac repressor binds to the DNA of the operator. The rest of the lac repressor is responsible for, induce, for inducer binding and tetramer formation. Now, thus we have the red crowned serpent head on the left representing the unbound headpiece and the white crowned serpent head on the right pointing to inducer binding and tetramer formation. All right, and last but not least, we have a sketch of Drader here. And Drader is the DSRNA specific adesine demonase, short for Drader. In hour four of the Amduat, the top register shows the wing HTH DNA binding protein Drader a protein that functions to modify viral RNA genomes and bonds tightly to ZDNA. The enzyme works by changing adenine so that it acts like guanine. It has the potential to re recode geno genomic information and alter protein functions. Let's back that up again. So basically, out of the, the four basic proteins, adenine, cytosine, thionine, and, and, and guanine, it can, it can change the adenine to guanine. So you could turn an A to a G with this. This is the function of that. Now, its structure reflects the characteristics of wings or beta sheet loops and the three alpha helices. Eukaryotes also experience RNA editing, which influences evolution by the continual interplay between RNA and DNA. So this specific serpent, winged, serp, winged three-headed serpent, is uh, primarily used to change adenine so it acts like guanine. Wow. It's just amazing that these guys are able to go into the bot, were able to, you know, point out these, uh, this gene expression in such detail, I'm just blown away. I know I've said it a hundred times and not, or more, but I'm just blown away. Shouldn't be able to do this. It's, it's, well, at least by the way that we think the ancients to be. We think they are uh, less intelligent than ourselves, but quickly, especially within the last five years, I am coming to understand that that too is a lie. Now, this is my drawing of Mercury, the god Mercury, or his staff. <laughs> but I just put this up here because this is widely known as the, the medical symbol, right? And, you know, of course it comes from Hermes or Hermes Trismegistus or Thoth or... Uh, any name you want to use. There's a lot of correspondences. Um, but it seems as though 
we thought this was just a staff or something that he was holding in his hand. But it seems as though with uh, the knowledge that we've been obtaining from the ISIS thesis that maybe I should look at this another way. This is really the structure of DNA right here. We got a beta sheet back here with these wings and we have an alpha helis. We have two snakes binding together. And this has been the symbol for uh, medicine for years and years and years, millenniums. So I'm going to, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say the ancients knew what they were depicting with this right here. And it wasn't just a staff for a God that they, uh, revered, <laughs> but that's all I got to talk about today. I, uh, I hope this was interesting to someone else and I hope it helps you to understand the ISIS thesis a little bit more or at least intrigue you to um, go and buy the book and break it down for yourself because that's really what it's, what it's about. It's about what you're going to understand out of it. It's about what you can bring to the conversation. Everybody does their due diligence. We all work together for the betterment of the whole here. So peace, shalom, hata. No, yeah, peace, shalom, hata. Thank y'all for coming out. God bless you. Good night.